AM 640. It's later with Mo Kelly. We're live everywhere on the iHeartRadio app. And if you were listening to KFI earlier, we brought you the remarks live of President Joe Biden from the Oval Office as he addressed his stepping aside from the Democratic nomination. He was the presumptive nominee until he wasn't. We're going to get into that in just a second and some of the repercussions and the consequences of it. But also, there's some other things we have to talk about tonight. There is a death investigation underway at a metro station in Pasadena. You thought I didn't know about that. Oh, yes, we're definitely going to talk about that. And if that weren't enough, remember how last week, Stefan, I know you remember, last week I was detailing this story about how Metro crime, violent crime, was down 40%, according to Metro, at the North Hollywood station. Okay? And then I got a message from Metro saying, hey, Mo, you didn't actually cover that story correctly. You missed some things. You left out some things. Yada, 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 blah, blah, blah. Well, the search is on for a suspect after a man was stabbed in the torso at a Metro station. Which one? North Hollywood. I don't know how that impacts the stats, but the violent crime has gone up since the last time we talked about North Hollywood. Anaheim is lowering its speed limits across the city. But before we get to any of that, we have to talk about what happened in the Oval Office earlier this evening. And I understand it was kind of curious. On Sunday, there was the written statement from the president saying, hey, I'm dropping out of the race and I'm endorsing Vice President Kamala Harris. But you can't see me because I'm sick. And then we didn't see him the next day. And then we didn't hear from him until the next, next day. And he called in to Harris's rally. We didn't see the president. And there were concerns. There were other conspiracy theories. Uh, conspiracy theories like, where is he? Do we need to invoke the 25th Amendment? And so forth and so on. So today, the president addressed the nation from the Oval Office. And I noticed, if you didn't hear it, we'll play some of the audio It was a very muted tone. It was a somber tone. It was a reflective tone. You saw and heard the president narrating the coming end of his political career. You didn't hear about any of the acrimony. You didn't hear about any of the behind the scenes arguments. You didn't hear about any of the unsettling behavior, which led to this moment. I'm talking about the Democratic Party pushing out its own sitting president the incumbent going into the election that has never happened now there have been presidents who have decided not to run for a second term we've seen that 1968 lyndon baines johnson perfect example and there are a lot of comparisons and parallels to 1968 this just being the latest But it wasn't under the same circumstances. LBJ had to deal with the Vietnam War. There were more external factors than there were internal factors. You didn't have the type of of intra-party discord that you saw with the Democrats. But you didn't hear that in the words of President Biden. Make of that what you will. But he did say he wanted to unify the party. And by unifying the party, it was the first step to unifying the nation if the Democrats were successful in November in defeating Donald Trump. But you didn't, you, I should say, you shouldn't have been surprised when you heard the softness of Biden's voice still getting over COVID. But here's a, a little bit of what he had to say. I've made it clear that I believe America is at an inflection point. One of those rare moments in history when the decisions we make now will determine our fate of our nation and the world for decades to come. America's going to have to choose between moving forward or backward, between hope and hate, between unity and division. We have to decide, do we still believe in honesty, decency, respect, freedom, justice, and democracy? In this moment, we can see those we disagree with, not as enemies, but as as fellow Americans. Can we do that? I don't know if we can. I honestly don't know if we can. But the message didn't even give a hint as to why this was the moment for him to step back, why he was saying that this was the time for younger voices, new voices, that he was passing the torch in the party. He didn't make any real mention of whether he felt that he could do the job, but he did make mention of his own personal ambitions and how they figured into why he wanted to run for a second term. But here is what Biden had to say about that passing of the torch. When you elected me to this office, 
I promise to always level with you, to tell you the truth. And the truth, the sacred cause of this country is larger than any one of us. And those of us who cherish that cause, cherish it so much, the cause of American democracy itself, must unite to protect it. You know, in recent weeks, it's become clear to me that I need to unite my party in this critical endeavor. I believe my record as president, my leadership in the world, my vision for America's future all merited a second term. But nothing, nothing can come in the way of saving our democracy. That includes personal ambition. So I've decided the best way forward is to pass the torch to a new generation. That's the best way to unite our nation. You know, there is a time and a place for long years of experience in public life. There's also a time and a place for new voices, fresh voices, yes, younger voices. And that time and place is now. I'm reminded of a quote by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. who said that a genuine leader is not someone who searches for consensus, but is a molder of consensus. And if there's going to be any unity within the Democratic Party, if there's going to be any unity going forward, it has to come from the top. It has to come from the president, who obviously is the leader of the country and is also the titular head of the party he represents. Whether he will be successful, big picture, well, history will decide. We'll see that as we go through the next three months leading into the election, and he has another five months or so before his actual term ends. He is officially a lame duck. He's not going to be able to get anything done legislatively because of the partisanship and the rancor that we're experiencing right now. He does have the option. He does have the power of the pen with respect to executive actions. And you'll probably see after the election a slew of pardons. No, I don't think Hunter will be pardoned. But he will not be able to accomplish much legislatively. This is about unifying the party and giving his party the best chance, if there is any chance, of the Democrats holding on to the White House and having a better show than what was forecast in the Senate and in the House. I'll have more thoughts and more audio concerning President Biden's address from the Oval Office earlier today in just a moment. You're listening to Later with Mo Kelly on demand from KFI AM 640. And we're talking about the recent Oval Office address by President Biden where he was explicit. He was handing over the party and the future as far as uh, politics to Vice President Kamala Harris. He was trying to unify the Democratic Party as well as unify the nation. That was the message. Whether it lands that way is up to you and you get to decide. But I I did notice beyond the, uh, I would say, expansive fundraising that Vice President Harris has been able to do in the days since President Biden made the announcement. There were other guideposts and I would say metrics you can look at to see how consequential it is in the minds of many voters. When I say voters, that includes new voters. Vote.org just announced nearly 700% increase in their daily voter registrations. More than 38,000 new registrations in just the 48-hour period following President Biden's announcement to step aside. It's the largest single number of voter registrations over a 48-hour period during this 2024 cycle. And this is um, signifying younger voters between 18 and 34. They accounted for 83% of the new registrations. Whether that is across uh, just a few states, is it evenly dispersed nationally? Don't know. But it's a, it's a little bit of an insight as to the enthusiasm which has been injected into this particular election cycle because of that announcement. Sometimes you can go from demoralized to energized overnight, and this is one of those occasions, at least for the short term. Don't know if this momentum is sustainable. Most likely it isn't. It's going to ebb and flow. But right now, there's a swell of support for Vice President Harris in her uh, campaign at this point. 
And speaking of her, um, let's get back to some of the audio of President Biden talking about why he's stepping aside and what the future may hold for him and also Vice President Harris. Just a few months, the American people will choose the course of America's future. I made my choice. I made my views known. I'd like to thank our great Vice President Kamala Harris. She's experienced. She's tough. She's capable. She's been an incredible partner to me and a leader for our country. Now the choice is up to you, the American people. I don't know. And I always say this. Who knows what's going to happen in November? And I keep getting notes from you. Trump is going to win easily in November. Well, that's wishful thinking. Yeah, You don't know. You just want that to be the case. Kamala Harris, she's raised so much money. There's no way that she's not going to just roll into the Oval Office. You don't know. That's just wishful thinking. We don't know what's going to happen. Two weeks ago, no one could have foreseen, not even the Democratic Party itself, that Joe Biden was going to step aside and he was going to be magnanimous, my word, in how he stepped aside. He didn't further prolong the argument. He didn't call out folks. He didn't go away angry mad. He didn't cause more division within the party. But in doing so, he's galvanized the base. He's taking at least one step in that direction where Democrats are more unified today than they were a week ago. I don't think anyone can argue that. They are donating. They are registering new voters. And they've injected a new enthusiasm into the party. Is it sustainable? Probably not. There's a lot that's going to happen. There are uh, debates, presidential debates, which are going to happen. Uh, there are going to be revelations, air quotes, however you want to phrase that. There are going to be stumbles by both presidential candidates. There's going to be vice presidential debates. There, there are going to be polls which are going to say one person is, is winning one week. And there are going to be polls the next week saying the other person is winning. This happens every single election cycle and then it gets real close down to the end and you may get a better feeling about how it's leaning or where it may head but then you have the actual election day and i've said this before i'll say it again you don't know what type of turnout you're going to get you don't know if there's going to be inclement weather in a key county in a key state which could tip the balance electoral in an electoral college sense you just don't know any of these things but you can see how things are moving in a general sense a week and a half ago republicans had all the momentum and there's no arguing it they had a fantastic rnc they had a swell of support they had a, a very fi- a very unified event you could see there was a palpable energy and support of former president trump um jd vance was well received None of that can be argued. And then a week later, the race looks completely different for reasons that none of us could have actually foreseen. We could have said that mm, it doesn't look likely that Joe Biden was going to drop out uh, or it doesn't look likely that he's going to make it to November. But then it happened and the way that it happened and how quickly the party united behind Kamala Harris, no one jumped in the race. No one challenged her for the presumptive nomination. No one said, well, we need to look at someone else. The delegates within 24 hours said, yes, we're going to pledge our votes to Kamala Harris. No one could have foreseen that. I personally thought there would have been challengers. I thought we were headed for a brokered convention. And I study this stuff every single day, all day, all night. Again, I'm just saying I can give you an educated guess, but no one really knows. And then the question is, because people are saying, well, was Biden going to step down? Is he going to resign from the position of president? Are they going to try to invoke the 25th Amendment? Well, they talk about that, but it, but it's not going to happen. It's not going to. If you read the Constitution and know what has to happen, none of that is going to happen. OK, yes, I know there was a Tennessee congressman who filed articles of impeachment against the vice president today. It, that's theater. That's for show. It's not going to go anywhere. You're going to have Joe Biden as president for the next five months or so until his term ends in January, January 19th. And here the president talks about what he plans to do, hopes to do, will try to do in the next six months. For the next six months. I'll be focused on doing my job as president. That means I'll continue to lower costs for hardworking families. 
grow our economy. I'll keep defending our personal freedoms and our civil rights, from the right to vote to the right to choose. I'll keep calling out hate and extremism. Make it clear there is no place, no place in America for political violence or any violence that ever, period. I'm going to keep, keep speaking out to protect our kids from gun violence. Our planet from climate crisis is the existential threat. And I will keep fighting my, for my cancer moonshot so we can end cancer as we know it because we can do it. And I'm going to call for Supreme Court reform because this is critical to our democracy, Supreme Court reform. You know, I will keep working to ensure America remains strong, secure, and the leader of the free world. I'm the first president in this century to report to the American people that the United States is not at war anywhere in the world. We'll keep rallying a coalition of proud nations to stop Putin from taking over Ukraine and doing more damage. We'll keep NATO stronger, and I'll make it more powerful and more united than any time in all of our history. I'll keep doing the same for our allies in the Pacific. You know, when I came to office, the conventional wisdom was that China would inevitably, would inevitably pass the United, surpass the United States. That's not the case anymore. And I'm going to keep working to end the war in Gaza, bring home all the hostages, and bring peace and security to the Middle East and end this war. We're also working around the clock to bring home Americans being unjustly detained all around the world. It's later with Mo Kelly. When we come back, we have not one, not two, but three major stories that we have to cover. There's a search on for the suspect after a man was stabbed in a torso at a metro station in North Hollywood. That would be the same station where violent crime is supposedly down 40%. There's a death investigation presently underway at a metro train station in Pasadena. Oh, gosh, a body was found on the platform. Happy Corpse Day. And also an assault rifle was used in a robbery of a San Fernando, say it with me, 7-Eleven. That's all next. That's all next in the next segment. It's almost like, Mo, this is for you. Well, I'm so humble. Thank you. KFI AM 640. We're live everywhere. The iHeartRadio app. You're listening to Later with Mo Kelly on demand from KFI AM 640. I was torn. I was, I was unsure how to do it. Do I spend more time on 7-Eleven or do I spend more time on the Metro? Because both deserve their equal attention. And then there was a deciding incident which made the decision for me. When a second person was harmed on this day on the Metro, it's like, well, that means the Metro wins two to one. Let me start with the first one. A death investigation is still underway. They call it a death investigation. I call it a murder investigation. But it's underway at a metro train station in Pasadena. Um, a death investigation centered on the Memorial Park station of the A-Line on Holly Street. Now, here's the funny part. And I do mean funny. This is from ABC, ABC7.com. It says light rail service through the area did not appear to be impacted by the investigation because we all know that's what's most important. Did everyone get to work on time or were they slowed down by the chalk outline, the corpse on the platform? Because it always sucks when your morning commute is impacted by a murder investigation, right? I know for me, I hate when that happens. I mean, it's not a great start to your day. Uh, uh, honey, how was traffic? Oh, it was fine, except for the corpse. It slowed us down. It took me a whole extra 20 minutes to get to the office. It's really unclear exactly what happened here now. This is the uh, old, used to be the gold line that runs underneath the Holly Street Village Apartments here in Pasadena on Holly Street. Uh, we could see the uh, uh, side entrance to the subway system, which is now the Metro A-Line, and we saw a train go by. Uh, but Pasadena PD, they're investigating a fatality here, uh, and we're not certain exactly uh, what occurred, but it doesn't look like it's affecting uh, the train or the subway system from what we can tell. It's just right next to and underneath the apartment complex murder next to metro nobody is surprised at all let's go to 7-eleven no actually let's not go to 7-eleven let's talk about the next story which is about 7-eleven prepositions matter 
An assault rifle was used in a robbery of a San Fernando Valley 7-Eleven. Is anybody surprised? You shouldn't be. I've been telling you, do not go to 7-Eleven, and especially don't go to 7-Eleven at night. This incident occurred around 3.30 a.m. this morning when a red car parked in front of a 7-Eleven store on Satakoy Street in Canoga Park. Three masked suspects got out. Nobody should be surprised. Surveillance video showed the suspects dressed dressed in black inside the store. One suspect could be seen holding an assault rifle and then pointing it at the clerk. Damn it, there is not enough money in the world for me to work at 7-Eleven. There is no way that you're going to get me to work at 7-Eleven where I might have an assault rifle pointed in my face at any time. Definitely some terrifying moments for the 7-Eleven clerk. By the way, he's still being questioned by LAPD detectives. So is the manager here at this Canoga Park 7-Eleven. The clerk still here working today. He says he's considering himself lucky to be alive. Security cameras uh, of the 7-Eleven recorded a red Hyundai here parking out front just after 3.30 this morning. The three masked suspects. Who robs a 7-Eleven in a Hyundai? Especially a red one. Kind of stick out. Three masked suspects jump out of the car and storm inside while one of them points an AK-47 at the poor clerk and demands cash. The two others take everything they can, including snacks, alcohol, cigarettes, and even water. The three of them are then seen. Who steals snacks? You're robbing a convenience store with an AK-47 and you're taking cigarettes and snacks. I know you're dumb to do it, but. But damn, that's like dumb on top of dumb. The three of them are then seen walking out just after a few minutes. We spoke with that startled clerk who didn't want his identity revealed. He says he saw his life flashing before his eyes. I'm not going to blame the clerk. I'm not going to blame the victim. But after a certain point, don't you just have to quit your job? You have to quit that job at least. How many more 7-Elevens need to get robbed before you realize that you're putting your life in danger. How many? The How problem many? is law is very soft, like a shoplifting, anything. They know that and they will get away within hours. And uh, the police can't do it, anything. After the robbery, the three suspects got into the red Hyundai where a getaway driver was waiting for them. They all took off with about $500 worth of cash. And yes, of course, a lot of merchandise. Of course, those suspects still on the run this morning. They are believed to be part of a criminal crew that is targeting several businesses here in the San Fernando Valley. As we come back at her live, the LAPD believes there were several people in this shopping plaza when this armed robbery happened. If you have any information, you're urged to contact police. all that. (laughs) $500. But wait, go ahead. Just go ahead, Stephanie. What is it with these bright colored cars that they're getting away in? I don't know. I assume. Because wasn't the last one like yellow or gold or something? I assume they're stolen. And even if it isn't (laughs) stolen, you have a say in the type of car you're going to use to commit your robbery. (laughs) If you're going to do it, at least give yourself the best chance to get away. Yeah. How many red Hyundais are there rolling around? Not a lot. Not a lot. Okay? And I I know you're dumb to do this, but come on now. Red Hyundai, at least no one got hurt. But 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 we have one more to discuss. This comes from the North Hollywood Metro Station where we were once told that we weren't getting the story right about how crime was down since May 28th. De- violent crime was down 40%. 40%. And I made the arguments like, are we talking about 40% of stabbings, 40% of murders? You know, what are we talking about here? Because we didn't know how many were happening for you to say it was a 40% decrease. If you're <laughs> saying that, you know, there were only four happening, I should say there are 10 happening, and then you had like four fewer, that's still six people getting stabbed and shot and so forth. All right. And let's say, you know, you had five of them happening and then only two fewer. There's still a lot of people getting harmed and maimed. So North Hollywood Station, back in the news, another stabbing. This time in North Hollywood where a man said was stabbed near the Metro Red Line. Happened just before 2 p.m. near Lancashire and Chandler Boulevard. Broad daylight. The says a man stabbed another man in the ribs with a knife on the steps up to the bus. The victim was taken to the hospital in unknown condition. The stabber took off on a black bike. We've reached out to Metro for comment but have not heard back. Metro has been plagued with violent incidents recently. I know. In May, Los Angeles Mayor Karen Bass I know. announced more security and law enforcement officers will be patrolling buses and trains. Got stabbed broad daylight and the assailant 
Well, it wasn't a red Hyundai, but it was a black bike. Rode his ass away. I don't get it. I wonder if you'll get an email now about your misreporting on this one. Well, I didn't get an email back because I very politely responded to him. I said, sir, you're wrong. You don't know what you're talking about. I was very, very polite. And I pointed him to the podcast, even the time cue of where it was in the podcast. So we'd have no problem finding it and hearing what I said verbatim. Didn't hear back from him. And I assume that I'm not going to hear back from him after this latest incident because it's I don't know what anyone can say in response. You should hear back an apology at least. No, that's not going to happen. Oh, I'm sorry. You are right about everything you said about this station. It'd be different if he had an ongoing conversation with me. It's like, yes, we acknowledge the problems. Yes, we acknowledge the violence. But here are some of the things that you may not know that we're also doing that hasn't been reported. And we wouldn't mind if you want, if you would include that in your reporting to give a more comprehensive view. But for you to only say you got it wrong, crime is down, and just deny and disregard the stabbings, the dead bodies, the murders, the assaults, uh, you know, <laughs> The thieves, the, the, the homeless, this is the, come on, come on. And we know before the week is out, someone else is going to be harmed violently on Metro. Why? Because it happens every damn week, every single week. You're listening to Later with Mo Kelly On Demand from KFI AM 640. If you plan to go to Disneyland, plan to just visit Anaheim, drive through Anaheim, at least as early as next week, you better slow down. And I mean really slow down or you might get a ticket. This is something which is going to be enforced. Anaheim Boulevard is one of 169 sections of road that will see speed limits reduced. The Anaheim Boulevard portion will have its 35 mile per hour speed limit lowered to 30. Quote, with the study, what we saw is that people that do drive through our streets are actually driving About 85% of them are driving to these lower speeds, close quote. And that's the city spokesperson, Natalie Aguirre. According to the city of Anaheim, 159 roads will see speed limits reduced by that five miles per hour. And nine sections of road will see limits lowered by 10 miles an hour. A portion of Manchester Avenue near the Disneyland Resort will have speeds drop 15 miles an hour from 40 to 25. So that is going to be significant. If you're used to, look, look, and I'm self-aware, I drive a little faster than I should. When I'm on the freeway, it's not often I'm driving 65 if I have the opportunity to go faster than 65. If I'm on surface streets, I'm not proud of it. I'm just saying I'm self-aware. I'm self-aware. And if the speed limit is 40 on the streets, well, I might hit 41, 42. And if you suddenly change it, and they're talking about new signs to be posted as early as next week, if you drop it from 40 to 25, that is significant, and people might need a little bit of time to adjust. I don't know about the enforcement, whether they're going to give people some warnings in the early going before they start rigidly enforcing it, but they're trying to make it clear that they are going to enforce it. Quote, the revenue doesn't come back directly to the police department from tickets, so it's not like we're out there enforcing the law and writing tickets to get money back. That's not the case. It costs a lot more to have an officer on the street, extra enforcement. And this is Anaheim Police Sergeant John McClintock trying to allay fears that this is something about money when it's not about money or or quotas, it's about safety. So if you're going to be driving through that area, just know that you're going to have to slow down. And I know that, you know, as I get older, I know I need to slow down. But you understand how it can be so very frustrating driving in Southern California. I don't flip off people like Mark Ronner. I don't do that. I only do what I have to do when I have to do it. There are no um, frivolous middle fingers given ever. Are you sure? Are you sure that you've never given out a middle finger undeserved? No, never. It's always, always been warranted. And you're not going to believe this, Mo. Sometimes people don't appreciate it. No. No. They, it's, it's like they think I'm the one who did something wrong by pointing out with that middle <laughs> finger that they've done something wrong. Yeah, I try not to escalate that stuff. Um, I try not to even stare down someone. 
they'll see my eye roll, but my face is still pointed forward. Yeah, don't don't make eye contact. That's yeah. like you're in prison and, and you could get shanked. Yeah, you can you can like give a disappointed head shake. Like your 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 parents and I are really disappointed in you, you imbecile. All right, and, and because anything more, and I don't want to be that person who unfortunately meets the wrong idiot who doesn't value life and is just going to start shooting. Yeah, because it could be somebody like Tawala, and you don't know what they're going to have in their trunk. And he will pull over and pop the trunk. I don't, I don't want or need that, but I do need to register my disapproval when somebody's driving like a dangerous, aggressive fool. And, and maybe I'm that you know old guy, get off my lawn, but yeah. I am really, really taken back when people are just driving recklessly. I'm not talking about speeding. I'm talking about the weaving in and out like you're in a movie, Fast and Furious 13, where you're racing your friend down the freeway, and you are assuming and depending on me and everyone else to be able to see you and not react in a way which causes a chain reaction accident. Oh, unforgivable. You're putting all our lives at risk to get a couple car lengths ahead. You, you, people should lose their licenses. And it's funny, hearing the sound of us talking about this, we're our parents now. Oh, we, we are. And part of it is wisdom and understanding because, look, I, I did some car racing back in the day, you know, from light to light. I, I did that stuff, okay? I'm self-aware, but I'm reformed now. I'm a new man. You've turned over a new leaf. Yes. And you've given up your life of, of being a scofflaw. I have not asked anyone to pull over in at least two decades. What, what happened when you did? Oh, he started pulling over. I started pulling over. And then when he saw that I was committed to it, he drove off. <laughs> oh, I remember. Okay. I was on, No, I was serious. I was on Ventura Boulevard. Yeah. I was right at about Laurel Canyon, if you know about where that is. And I was going, I was going to Blockbuster. So that ought to tell you about when this was, because there was a Blockbuster at Laurel Canyon and Ventura Boulevard. Uh -huh. So I'm driving um, east on Ventura Boulevard. This guy starts yelling at me. I don't know what precipitated, but we got into a verbal altercation. And car you're like, car. sir, this will not stand. Right. <laughs> and I said, pull the mother father car. Oh, pull over. Yeah. We can do this broad daylight. In front of everybody. Was that dumb? Yes. Uh -huh. But, you know, I was a hothead back then. I really was. I start pulling over. He starts pulling over. He sees that I'm, like, pulling over and parking. Boop, boop. I'm getting into the parking space because I'm going to be there for a second. It's like two samurais <laughs> on opposite sides of the bridge. You're sizing each other up and then. Right. And then he realized that I was actually parking. And he took that as an opportunity to just drive away, which was best for both of us. I'm just saying, you know, I'm, I'm much better now. I don't do that stuff anymore. No, not recommended. But what you are also saying is that that man was terrified of you. Kind of, sort of. <laughs> kind of, sort of. You know, I see. I, I, as far as I'm concerned, I won that confrontation. Well, you take the wins you can get. Yeah, yeah you know, and, and now I'm at the age like I have no problem backing down if only because it's not worth whatever could happen. You know, I don't want to end up. On KTLA.com, KFI radio host gets his ass whooped. <laughs> Road rage incident. Arrested. Film at 6 o'clock. No, I don't want that. No, I don't no, want th that. That's the thing. Anytime you have any kind of job in the media, you have to keep your nose extra clean, cleaner than any normal person, because that's exactly what's going to happen. That's right. No boogers. No boogers. <laughs> no, no, no stalactites. <laughs> KFI AM640 live everywhere on the iHeartRadio app. I don't know what you're thinking. And I kind of like that. Keeps it fun. KFI. And KOST HD2. Los Angeles. Orange County. Live everywhere.